So it's wonderful to see you. Welcome. Uh, it's the day after, or the Sunday after Easter Sunday, and I think what happened last week should actually define the next 30 or 40 years of our lives. And uh, that's what the book of Acts was written after Easter Sunday. And uh, the more I thought about last week, the more I just, this anything can happen, anything can happen. But sometimes when you come to church for a long time, we kind of settle down to the normal things happening. If you said to me a year ago that Sheila Rossley will be baptized in your church publicly in front of everybody, I would say never. Never in a million years. And if you had asked her, she would have said never in a million years. But anything can happen. That guy who sat next to me last week, who played SA schools rugby and cricket, who cried the whole way from the beginning of the service to the end of the service, for five years has given me a hard time at my son's school around my faith. It's a Christian school, and when they go on tour, they're meant to go to church, but our age group never went to church because that group of guys decided that they would never set foot in church on any of their rugby tours. But on Easter Saturday at nine o'clock, he phoned me and said, I want to come and spend Easter with you. And he cried his whole way through it. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. On Easter Sunday last week, I picked up a young man. There was a group of youngsters that went out for, to Burger King. So I thought I'd go and join them. I was the oldest by about 42 years. <laughs> but there's a young man in this church and he, he's got a job now and he needs a car and his dad died when he was eight. And uh, sometimes we ask God to give us bread from heaven. And sometimes, like that little boy, we put the bread that we've got into Jesus' hands. And he performs a miracle. Amen? And, and so we were talking about helping him get a car and, and how we're going to do that. And how we're going to finance a car to make his job easier. And I said, do you have any bread? Do you have, do you, do you have even just a little bit of bread that you can put into God's hand? He said, yes, actually, I inherited a BMW from my dad. But it's nearly 18 years old and it hasn't driven for a long time and it's a Nell Sprite. And I thought, wow, that's a long way away for a car that's not driven for a long time. But when my son was in grade nine, when the new grade eights come into the school, the grade nine has to look after a grade eight. That's how it works at boarding school. The grade eight that he looked after, his father just owns BMW and Nell Sprite. So I just phoned him on Monday. I said, how's it, John? It's Rory. Uh, we've got a guy in our church who's got a car that his father left him many years ago and it hasn't driven for a long time. Do you mind if that may be good? Anything can happen in the church. Anything can happen. Cars, people, marriages, anything can happen. Amen? Amen. I went down, I've just, I just flew back about an hour ago. I went to a funeral, a wedding, and a 40th in the last three days. It's been amazing. Happy, sad, happy. The funeral was happy, the marriage was sad. No, 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 no. I'm only joking. No, no, that's not the truth. But, but I, was, I was at this funeral of Ian McIntosh. His, his son is the one who gave us the coffee shop. And, and there were just so many, there were just Springboks. Val Botman and Dick Muir and Wayne Favey and Henry Honeyball and all these Springbuck guys there and... We had a funeral in the church, then we went to King's Park, and all the Springbok rugby captains spoke, and everybody who's anybody spoke, and it was just like this who's who of the zoo, and the TV was there, and they were recording this whole thing, and I thought, this is unbelievable, some of the best speakers in the world, John Allen, who was the Springbok hooker and the Scottish hooker, was one of the best speakers I've ever heard, I actually wrote him a letter, just an amazing speaker, and I thought, how's this whole thing go to crescendo, and he says, we're going to wrap up now, and we're going to call up uh, Warren Brosnahan, who's going to come and wrap the thing up. Warren Brosnahan's a member of our church. He gets up and he just smacks it out the park. Just boof, out the park. And I thought, I'm sitting at a funeral in King's Park and the whole thing's wrapped up by a member who was with us on Easter Sunday. God can do anything. Say anything. Anything. God can do anything. And when we read the book of Acts... It's the Sunday after Easter where they actually believe in the resurrection power of Christ and they start to live their lives accordingly. The most powerful advocate, we're back on you guys. How's it? <laughs> you thought I'd forgotten you, eh? No, I haven't. One of my mates who's in another, another church, he said, hey, one of your advocates came to visit us the other day. I said, I'm so surprised. I never thought that would happen. 
But the top advocate in America was a guy called Chuck Colson. And he was Richard Nixon's advocate when Watergate hit and uh, he was sent to prison. And this is what he writes about the resurrection. This is an advocate. Eh? This, is, this is the top legal man in America who ends up in prison because of Watergate. I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. Richard Nixon was impeached. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. And so we have to stand here, friends. We have to stand here fully convinced that the resurrection took place and God can actually do anything in any one of our lives at any time. There was a man in the book of Acts who was crippled for 40 years and one day, bang, he came out of his wheelchair. This guy has got a brother who's in a wheelchair and he brings him here Sunday after Sunday. He, he lives in Kroblesdal, but whenever he can, he just brings him here inside of his heart. Is God, will you appear? God, will you break in? God, will you heal? Yeah. And I'm going to say, Gary, I stand with you. I stand with you, say, but Rory, we've prayed for him a hundred times. Well, let's pray a hundred and one times so we don't just settle down into some suburban church where we come together, sing a few songs, clap something, give a little bunny, but we actually trust that the supernatural power of God can break in here. Amen? He can give us dreams and visions. He can set up businesses under the supernatural power of God. I was on a Zoom call this week trying to reconcile two businessmen who have had a fallout. And I said, guys, if we put Jesus in the middle, you see, friends, church is Jesus goes in the center and you are at the outside and you worship Jesus. You don't come to church where the pastor stands and says, there are people in here who've got marriage issues. We know there are people here with marriage issues. There are people with financial issues. There are people with health issues. And all of a sudden, we're just ministering to you. No, we lift Jesus high. And those with marriage issues, look at him. And those with financial issues, look at him. And when he takes the center stage, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Amen? So let's read Acts chapter 1, please. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. You have to, have to, have to believe in the resurrection of Christ. Otherwise, what we do on Sundays is pointless, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. I sat yesterday at this wedding opposite Vincent and Liz Good the very first couple I ever married 28 years ago. I sat opposite them. And I was thinking about Simon and Carmen sitting up there and about Marissa and Daniel sitting over there that I'm about to do their weddings. And sitting on this side of Melanie was a couple that have been married 27 years right now contemplating, separating and divorcing. And I'm sitting in this turmoil and inside of my heart is the message that I preach after Resurrection Sunday. And I say that couple who lost their jobs, Vincent and Liz, who lost their jobs in COVID, who went bankrupt in COVID, who had to sell their home in COVID, who've had to move into a one bedroom flat, are still worshiping God, are still believing Jesus, are still praying to the Father in heaven. That couple that have just got married have kept themselves pure. They've been dating for six years. They've not slept together because they've wanted to honor God and they want to know the power of His resurrection inside of their marriage. And I want to sit to this couple and say, please, will you just allow Jesus to raise you from the dead? That's the kingdom. 
It's when the power of God comes face to face to the power of death. And everywhere where Jesus went, he, blind eyes were opened, crippled people walked, demons fled, the dead were raised, prostitutes and the poor were invited closer for dinner. That's the kingdom of God. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Say the kingdom of God. For 40 days he spoke... On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. That's how we did the first series of the year. Instead of starting with fasting, we started with feasting from this verse. But the verse before says, for 40 days, he spoke about the kingdom of God. Say the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Say Jesus, Jesus and the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Let's look at the last verse of, of the book of Acts. The last verse of the book of Acts. Boldly. And let's say boldly. And without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God. And he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Capital L. Now say it with me. Capital L. Capital J. Capital C. Let's say it again. Capital L. Capital J. Capital C. Vincent Liz Good believe in the capital L, J, and C of Jesus Christ. The couple that gave themselves to sexual purity believe in the L, J, and C of Jesus Christ. And the couple on the left, somehow, in the busyness of church and the busyness of life and trying to provide for their families, somewhere along the line, capital has become small letter. And inside of the book of Acts, there are unbelievable stories, friends. But the book of Acts starts with Jesus and the kingdom, and the book of Acts ends with Jesus and the kingdom. And you put up your hand and say, Rory, what about me? Yes, you're important. Yes, your story is important. And as Simon and, and, and Carmen are about to get married, there's some people sitting in this room who are going through divorce. You say, but what about me? Just put Jesus and the kingdom inside of your story. You'll put your story inside of Jesus and the kingdom. And God can do anything. The kingdom can actually come. He said, Rory, don't understand my upbringing. Just put it in the side of Jesus and the kingdom. Because inside of this room, there's some that are making love and there are some that are making war. There are some who are at peace and there are some who are absolutely fighting. There are some who are emotionally stable and there are some that are taking psychiatric tablets. Sitting in this room today. But the beauty of the Sunday after Easter is God can do anything. Anything can happen. You say, Rory, what does that mean? Friends, I never lost a day's sleep in my life until I came into ministry. And then I'd never read the Bible and I was leading a church of a thousand people. I hadn't read through the Bible. They told me to leave the church. And so I, I lost my sleeping patterns. Then I started doing weddings. I'd get home at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. And I'd wake up at three and I'd start drinking too much coffee and eating too much. And I'd put on weight and I lost my sleep. And my whole life went out of sync. And for 15 years, I wouldn't take medication. I was a complete and utter insomniac. And then I need to take sleeping tablets. And now I take sleeping tablets every night. People say, but trust God. I am trusting God. I am trusting God. I want his kingdom to come into my sleep patterns. The Bible says God gives sleep to everybody he loves. And people say, but God gives sleep to everybody he loves. I said, I know that, but I still can't sleep. You think God loves you? He absolutely adores me. He loves me more than you, according to my theology. <laughs> no, I'm being dead serious. I know it's not biblical theology. It's just experiential theology. <laughs> Friends, I drove back from Cape Town the other day, 1,450 kilometers. I got in my car. I drove 1,450 kilometers. It took me exactly, I won't tell you the time. <laughs> Average speed, 119. One twenty-one. I don't know. So it was close. It's close. I've not got one speeding fine. And I thought today I'm going to break this the cycle of, and I'm going to sleep. And I got into bed. And I thought fourteen hundred and fifty k's. Couldn't sleep. Three hours later, sleeping tablet. You say, Rory, but that's not faith. No, friends, I can't sleep. But you know what? Every single day I ask God, God, may your kingdom come in my, whatever this thing is that's stopping me sleep, may your kingdom come and your will be done. I'm trusting you, God, for an impartation of your power so that I don't have to take sleeping tablets. Amen? 
Say kingdom. kingdom. Say kingdom. kingdom. The kingdom come. The kingdom come. And we start to see in the book of Acts, the kingdom starts to come. Crippled people start to walk. We know this, friends. Terry and Wendy Virgo had a, a lady in England who was in a wheelchair for eight years. And she trusted God and all the big names prayed. At the funeral of Ian McIntosh, his grandson who's sick, who came to this church, they took him up to Angus Buchan. And Angus prayed for him and he wasn't healed. They trust in God for healing. And one day this lady in her wheelchair got wheeled into a church and a woman who had been saved for one week came to the pastor and said, God told me that, I must, that that lady needs to be healed. God told me. And the pastor said, you must lay hands. She said, no, I've never laid hands on anybody. Pastor, you must. Friends, it's not gonna come through the pastor. It's not gonna come through Angus Buchan. It's gonna come through you. You sitting in the marketplace. You sitting next to somebody who's been abused. You sitting next to somebody who's sexually crippled. You sitting some next to somebody who's gone bankrupt. It's gonna come through you. And you've gotta believe God can do anything. Anything can happen. I want us to lift our expectation that when we meet and sing songs, friends, that God can do anything. Absolutely anything. People say to me, how do you define the kingdom of God? Such a massive subject. The kingdom of God is simply like this. It's where God has no rival. Where he's ruling without rival. Where God is king. Here's my wallet. If you look inside it, and you look at my slips, you'll know who's my boss. You'll know whether Jesus is king of my wallet because I've got a lot of rivals on this piece of leather. I've got a wife who's far less demanding than yours. <laughs> I've got school fees to pay. I've got electricity bills to pay, and, 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 and I've only got so much in my wallet, and there's an unbelievable demand, but when I say, Lord, let your kingdom come, I mean it must start there first. Surely. Because it says you can't serve God and money. Amen? I've tithed for 30, 33 years. Last month, it was the first time in my life I thought I'm not going to tithe. Why? Because I'm evil. Because I'm selfish. Because I'm, I think I'm, just because I'm a jerk. And, and, and Mel said, why are you battling? I said, I don't know. She said, but you've always tithed. I said, I know. She said, but just tithe again. I said, but I don't feel like it. <laughs> you think, Rory, do you also struggle? I struggle. And I'm preaching a sermon today. Let the kingdom come. We're going into the toll gates at, 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 down at near Pine Town there. It's like full, 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 full. On the right is the Shisa lane. On the next thing is uh, the credit card lane. And our toll thing doesn't work anymore. Because I haven't filled it up. So I just see this long queue. So I swerve right and I'm going towards the credit card lane. Mel says, we haven't got any money in the toll. I know that. He said, why do you shout? I said, I'm not shouting. <laughs> what are you preaching on tomorrow? I'm talking about the kingdom of God in my language, my darling. <laughs> I'm talking about the place where Jesus rules without rival. I'm talking about my mouth, and I'm talking about my, my money, and I'm talking about let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Will you reverse the curse of what Adam's selfishness looked like, Lord God? Will you reverse that curse? And will you start to restore full health into our relationships and into our marriages and into our words and to the way that I speak to my wife? So I tithed last week. Whew, relief. And then I get a message from my son's school. He left last year. Hi, Mr. Tyre. 
The COVID relief fund from 2020 has decided to give the boarding school parents money back. Triple my time. If you would like to consider adding it to the bursary fund, <laughs> would you possibly, I said, thank you so much. I've considered it at deep length. <laughs> Put it in this account number, please. <laughs> Urgently. My son left a year ago. I want my money back. I just thought, you know, you know the Bible says, it says, it says, if you tithe, you can test God in this. If you tithe, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Then I thought, I think there are a lot of people in this church that don't tithe. How do I know that? It's just because the size of the church and the income means you don't tithe. No, I'm not, but I've never put pressure on you. This building's paid for. We've got a small staff. We've got a small budget because I want to keep people free. But I thought, let's do this. Let's aim for the end of August. The end of August, five months, for every single person in our church to tithe on one Sunday. On one Sunday. That means if you've got no faith, you've got a 2% faith, for the next five months, put your 2% aside. And on the last Sunday of August or the first Sunday of September, the whole church will tithe. And let's see how God throws open the floodgates of heaven. Let's see about promotions and about healing and about jobs. And maybe we'll see people get out of wheelchairs. Because he said he'll throw open the floodgates of heaven. Yeah. I've seen a little blessing with Sheila Rossley and Greg Miller. Amen? And a 3CR guy finishing a funeral. And a guy who owns BMW. Just little bit by little. Imagine if he just throws open the floodgates of heaven. Imagine if he just throws open the floodgates of heaven. If people said to me, Rory, how would you like to finish your life? If, if you read the book of Acts, what do you, what do you see in the book of Acts? What, what do you see? I see four things. Just four very, very simple things. I would like to glorify God. I would like to grow in Christ. I would like to serve the church. And I'd like to bless the world. I want to glorify God. I want to glorify God in the way I speak to my wife. I want to glorify God in the way that I spend my money. I want to glorify God in the way I prepare my sermons. I want to glorify God, whether you're a dentist or an artist. I want to glorify God. Ian McIntosh, the Springbuck coach and the Natal legend, his son got up, Craig, his son got up and he said, God was always in our life, but he was kind of like on the edge of our life. He was there, but, but he was periphery to our life. We had rugby, and we had sport, and we had uh, education. So, so the Macintoshes moved, how's this? The Macintoshes moved down from Zimbabwe. And they put it down to a guy called Rod Gould. So in this middle of this ceremony, they say the man that actually allowed the Macintoshes to come to South Africa is a man called Rod Gould. Rod Gould's mother and my grandmother we're sisters. My grandmother, who was married to an Anglican pastor that married some of you, married this lady and her husband 53 years ago. And so it all sort of starts to intertwine. So Ian McIntosh gets a coaching job in Wales, and Newport that he's coaching is about to go through into the finals. They're playing the semifinals, they're winning, and in the last 30 seconds, a bizarre refereeing decision, which is absolutely unfounded, which is completely without reason or logic, takes place, Newport lose, they get eliminated from the competition, Ian McIntosh walks out of the stadium, he gets into his car and he says, today I denounce Jesus Christ. Today I denounce Jesus Christ. He said, that is the most bizarre thing. He is not in charge of the world. He cannot be alive. It's completely unfair for that to take place. I denounce him. You see what happens, friends? When a bracket goes down of Jesus and the kingdom, then anybody runs into our story. In the book of Acts, there's storms, there's sorcery, there's Satan, there's snake bites, there's shipwrecks. 
everything that you're going through. But when Jesus and the kingdom are the brackets, we can hold on and anything can happen. You know, Peter got freed from jail and he knocks on the door. There's a lady called Rhoda in the Bible. She's a servant girl. She's a maid. And she hears the knock. And she gets put into the Bible for the rest of the life for people to read the most sold book in history because she heard a knock. It's all she did. She didn't even open the door. She just heard the knock. Imagine if you just hear God knocking. Just... Just a little knock. I got a phone call from the headmaster of Hatfield this week. Hi, Rory. You know that photograph when that guy was killed in 1976 in the riots in Soweto? Not Soweto, wherever. Sharpville. One of the people in that photograph has just died, and the ANC have given him a state funeral, and they can't organize a funeral in time. Is your building available? Sorry, Graham, I'm not there. I'm down in the tunnel. I've got a wedding and a funeral in the 40th. But phone Damien. Damien, can you pull it off? Yes, within two hours, the protocol team come here. And this week, friends, standing on that stage was Dr. Nkosazana Zuma, the premier of the ANC in, in Gauteng. And we had an ANC state funeral in this building because anything can happen. He said, but you're desecrating the temple of God. This is not the temple of God. This is brick and mortar. You're the temple of God. This is just an opportunity to get a corrupt government saved. And they came in here over and over again, and the, and the premier of Gauteng said, I need a special call. So we took him into a side room, and we put our Wi-Fi, and he was meeting in that room, and the other oak was meeting in this room. And all the aliens, and you know what they said? We want to come back here. Craig McIntosh said this, his dad had never ever read a rugby manual in his life. He never studied rugby, he never studied coaching, he never went on a coaching course. All his coaching was by instinct. And Sunday he woke up and he started to prepare for his practices and he got, could get not one thought in his mind. Not one thought. He, he opened the book and he couldn't write it down. Monday he woke up and he tried to write some thoughts down and he couldn't get any thoughts in his mind. He was completely and utterly blocked. And he drove to the stadium and he thought, I'm going to coach for the first time in my life and I don't know what to say. And we got to the stadium, he got out of his car, he got down on his knees and he said, Jesus Christ, I will make you the center of my life. And he said, all of a sudden, the gift of coaching came back to him. The gift of coaching came back to him. He went on to win four curry cups after that time. And he gives all glory to God. He said, I can take no glory for myself because the resurrected Jesus gave me a gift to coach. And some of you got a gift to do business and some of you got a gift to engineer and some of you got a gift to start schools and some of you got a gift to receive it, to glorify God. Say glorify God. The second thing is to grow in Christ. It says in the book of Acts, they knew Jesus accurately, but they didn't know him adequately. I've looked at my life. I, I, I want to grow. I want to become an undefendable person. Jesus was unoffendable. And I realized that the biggest issue in the church is people get offended. That's why there's an advocate looks sitting at another church. You say, but Rory, you are offensive. Don't get offended. Don't get offended. We sit here by the grace of God. Guys, that sits up there, so he, he got in his car the other day and he went home and he said, Rory's gonna get bombarded with letters today. His wife said to him, you don't understand Rory. He's not trying to irritate you. He's trying to set you free in the gospel. I want to be an unoffendable person. I want to grow in Christ. I want to know that the offense that he took is greater than any offense that I could ever take. And I believe it'll become attractive to the kingdom and to the power of God. Amen? Amen? I want to serve the church. The whole way through Acts, they just serve. They go there and they serve the church. Friends, you're not here to fill a chair on a Sunday and tip the tipping basket. You're here to serve the church. It says you are one body, many parts. This is my friend that I, 
we tease a lot, we tease each other. But I tell you what, I could not build the church without this man. His name is Francois. He's a gift of God to me. And we are one body in many parts. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. The appendix cannot say to the chest, I don't need you. So what are you? Are you a kidney? Are you the heart? Are you an artery? Are you the brain? Are you the mouth? Are you the nose? Are you the eyes? Are you something? You've got to serve the church with that gift and bless the world and bless the world. God can do anything. God can do anything. God can do anything. Longer, God can do anything. Absolutely anything. I've seen it. I have many convincing proofs that Jesus is alive. God can do anything. Precious lady, God can do anything. Absolutely anything. A brother of a man in a wheelchair, anything can happen. Any, is it false hope? Is it a false promise? I believe in the depth of the depth of my heart that anything can happen. In Jesus' name, amen.